This is the first lecture video for Chapter 24, Transition Metals and Coordination Compounds. So in the first slide, I've actually put a little joke here. And the caption of the, the, the cartoon says, Late that night, Professor Robinson's laboratory was overrun by hostile elements. And you see this picture of an atom pointing a gun at the professor. And he asks him, you the guy who just made a seven-coordinate compound of chromium-3? Well, we've got a message for you. Chromium-3 doesn't like being seven-coordinate. So the humor in that joke is that many of the transition metals have no more than six coordination numbers. So as we look at some of these transition metals, we'll learn to appreciate some of the differences of transition metals compared to other elements on the periodic table and what makes the transition metals unique and why they're unique. So in class, we'll actually do a demo of nickel with the addition of ethylene diamine. And we can see some of the properties of transition metals illustrated in this demonstration. So one of the things that I like about transition metal chemistry is that it's very unique compared to the rest of the periodic table. Um, and when I teach the inorganic course to the seniors, one of the questions I often pose to them is, what do you know about transition metals and what do you think about when somebody mentions a transition metal? But you probably haven't been exposed to as much transition metals in your career as of yet. But hopefully after the qual scheme and after we finish this chapter, you'll be able to better appreciate how important transition metals are to your everyday life and what makes them unique. So some of the things that make transition metal chemistry unique compared to the chemistry of the rest of the periodic table are the unique colors associated with transition metal complexes. Many of them are very highly colored. They often have magnetic properties, either they're ferromagnetic, paramagnetic, or diamagnetic. So ferromagnetic just means that you have a strong magnetic moment. So something like the magnets on your refrigerator. Or they may be paramagnetic, which means you have at least one unpaired electron, so it's going to be slightly attracted to a magnetic field. Or they could be diamagnetic. So if you remember back from Kim 1A, that means all of the electrons are completely paired together. So that would be, those compounds would be slightly um, repelled by a magnetic field. Transition metal, com transition metal complexes also display a lot of different geometries with different coordination numbers. They're also stable in multiple oxidation states. And it's these features that often make them good catalysts. And these properties are a result of the d orbitals and the transition metal complexes. So just to highlight to show you what the d orbitals look like, the dz squared is probably the most unique of the, the d orbitals. There are two lobes in the same phase, but there's a donut around the center that's in a, a different phase than the other two lobes. And this is oriented along the z-axis. The other d orbitals all have similar shapes. They all have four lobes with alternating phases. The difference is which axis they lie on or where they're oriented within three-dimensional space. The, DZ, the dx squared minus y squared lie on the x and y axes, but the dxy lie in between the x and the y axes. And the dyz lies in between the, the z and the y axes and the dzx lie in between the z and the x axes. So understanding the shapes and their orientations help to understand other properties of the transition metal complexes. Now we need to go through a few definitions so that we can speak the language of an inorganic chemist. The first thing that we want to differentiate is between the term d-block elements and transition metal elements. The 
D block metals are scandium through zinc and lanthanum through mercury. So these all have D electrons in the D, D orbitals. So the D are in the valence orbitals. So remember, this is my S block. This is my P block. This is my F block. This is my D block on the periodic table. The transition metals are very similar to the D blocks, except it's a smaller group. The definition for a transition metal is an element that has at least one simple ion with an incomplete outer set of D electrons. So you have to have at least one electron in the D orbitals, or you have to have at least one vacancy in the D orbitals. So the D orbitals are basically titanium to copper and hafnium to gold. So here's titanium, here's hafnium, here's copper, and here's gold. So these make up the transition metal elements. For scandium, the common oxidation state for scandium is scandium 3 plus. And in the 3 plus oxidation state, there are no D electrons. We've removed two electrons from the S and one electron from the D. So it has no more D electrons left. So if there are no electrons in the D orbital, it cannot be a transition metal because there is no electron in the D orbitals to transition to other D orbitals. Now if we make the comparison with zinc 2 plus, zinc 2 plus is a D10. If we line up one, two, three, four, all five of those D orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the D orbitals are full, so none of those electrons can move to any of the other orbitals. So the electrons can't transition. So zinc is not a transition metal complex. And for similar reasons, neither is cadmium or mercury. So you'll sometimes hear people use the two terms interchangeably, the D block elements and transition metals, but there is a difference between the two terms. There's some other terms that we need to discuss before we start looking at transition metal complexes. The first is ligand. These are atoms, ions, or molecules that formally donate electrons to the metal. So if we look at our picture here, we have a ammonia molecule. And when the ammonia binds to the metal, we then call it an amine ligand. So it's got the lone pair. So this is what this mo molecule is. It's an amine ligand attached to a cobalt center. A coordination compound. Coordination compounds are composed of a metal atom or ion and one or more ligands. So here below in this picture, this entire thing is our coordination compound. It includes the complex ion, so it includes, it includes the cobalt with the six amines bound to it, and it includes the three counterions. So if I were to write this out, I would write cobalt and ammonia in the parentheses and a subscript six to indicate that there are six amines bound to the cobalt and the brackets around this indicate to the reader that what's inside is the complex. So they, um, all these things that are written here are actually attached to the metal. They're, they are complexing the metal. And the overall charge is a three plus. There are three counterions or three chlorides. So we write Cl super subscript 3. So this entire thing here is the coordination compound. Complexes are coordination compounds and they are acid base addicts. So the part that has the metal ion with ligands attached to it, that is the complex. A complex can be neutral or it can be charged. If the complex is charged, we call this a complex ion. So notice that this complex has a three plus charge. 
When the amine binds to the cobalt, this forms a coordinate covalent bond. So a lone pair that's donated to a metal to form a adduct in this Lewis acid base type chemistry. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about coordinate covalent bond formation. So the metal ion is acting as a Lewis acid and the ligand is acting as a Lewis base. In this complex, there are six atoms attached to the cobalt. This is the coordination number. The coordination number is the number of atoms bound to the metal. And there'll be times when you have more things attached to the metal than there are ligands. And we'll give an example of this in a few slides. The next term is a chelating ligand. A chelating ligand is a ligand with two or more points of attachment to metal ions. And then a chelate, the chelate is the compound that contains the chelating ligand. So compounds containing chelate ligands and the name is derived from the Greek term chile, which means claw of the crab. And as we describe chelating ligands, we describe how many times they bite or how many points of attachment we have to the metal. So the denticity refers to the number of binding sites on the ligand. So the higher the denticity, the, number, the higher the number of binding sites on the ligand. So let's look at complex ion formation with another complex. A complex ion formation is a type of Lewis acid base reaction. So here the ammonia has a lone pair. It donates those lone pairs to the silver to form this adduct. And the bond between these, this is called a coordinate covalent bond. And the coordinate covalent bond is what makes transition metal chemistry or coordination chemistry so unique. That bond is not as strong as what we typically think of as a normal covalent bond. This ammonia, or this amine rather, can actually dissociate from the silver and be replaced with other ligands. And it's that exchangeability or that lability of that ligand that makes transition metals so unique and makes them excellent catalysts. Because if you want a catalyst to work very well, the reagent has to come in, bind to the metal, do its chemistry, and then be released. Now the bond that forms when the pair of electrons is donated by one atom, this is called the coordinate covalent bond. So this would be one of the coordinate covalent bonds, and this would be the other coordinate covalent bonds. Sometimes you will see a coordinate covalent bond being represented as an arrow showing the donation of electrons to the metal center. Some ligands can form more than one coordinate covalent bond with a metal atom. There are lone pairs on different atoms that are separate enough so that both can reach the metal. And these ligands that have more than one points of attachment are called chelates, and chelate is a complex ion containing a chelate is a complex ion containing a multi a chelate is a complex ion containing a multi dentate ligand the ligand is called the chelating agent so here we have the example ethylene diamine and this is a bidentate ligand the nitrogens are close enough together that they can bind to the metal centers and there's some flexibility within uh, this backbone here. So in reality, let's say I have a nickel 2 plus and I expose it to ethylene diamine. The nitrogens can rearrange themselves so that here you've got carbon back here with hydrogens on the backbone. But the lone pairs are situated so that they're pointing right at the metal center. So the lone pairs will donate to the nickel to make two coordinate covalent bonds. So this is what we call a bidentate ligand. 
because it bites twice. So right now, with the way we've got the nickel drawn, the coordination number is two, but there's only one ligand attached to the metal. So you have one donor atom and another nitrogen donor atom. Each of these bite to the metal, and this is where we get the term bidentate. So this is a chelating ligand because it chelates, it bites twice, but the nickel complex itself is called the chelate. Here are some examples of common ligands. Water is a common ligand, ammonia, the chloride ion, carbon monoxide, cyanide, and thiocyanate. Notice with each of these ligands, there are lone pairs to act as a Lewis base to bind to the Lewis acid metal center. You will also have to be able to determine the charge of the ion or the, the ligand. So think about, you should think you should know that a water molecule is neutral and ammonia is neutral. But the chloride, we know that it likes to form a minus one complex. But if we just draw the Lewis dot structure of chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven valence electrons but it has not met the octet. So to have it reach its octet, if we give it an extra electron, to have eight, the charge, overall charge becomes minus one. And for the cyanide, if you were asked to draw the Lewis dot structure of Cn, there are four plus five, so a total of nine valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, but carbon doesn't have its octet met. So to make it have a filled octet, we're going to give it an extra electron. So this is where it gets its minus one charge. So nine plus one gives a total of 10 valence electrons. Other ligands include the oxalate ion. So the oxalate ion is another type of bidentate ligand. So you can imagine a metal ion here binding to that lone pair and binding to that lone pair. Ethylene diamine. Ethylene diamine tetraacetic. Ethylene diamine tetraacetate. So this is often abbreviated EDTA. With this, there are actually six points of coordination to the metal side. So there's six donor atoms. So this is a hexadentate ligand. So hexadentate. This means that there are six points of attachment. There are the two nitrogens with the lone pairs. And then there are the lone pairs on these oxygens. So one, two, three, four, or a total of six. So ethylene diamine is a very good chelating ligand. Those six points of attachment mean that it binds to the metal ion very strongly. And it's going to have a very large formation constant. So this is just to show you where the metal ion would bind to. It would attach to these six points on the ADTA ligand. Here we've got an example of two different complexes. On the left, we have the cobalt ethylene diamine complex, and there are three ethylene diamines. There's one, two, and three. But the coordination number for this cobalt complex is six. There's one, two, three, four, five, six things 
bound to that cobalt metal center. So this is a complex ion. Now we have an example of another cobalt complex where cobalt is bound to EDTA. It is also six coordinate, but this time it's only bound to one ligand. It's bound to the EDTA molecule. So here we find the nitrogens that it's bound to. Then you have an oxygen arm that wraps around to one end, another oxygen arm that wraps around, and you can't really see it because it's down here. So this forms the plane of the ligand. This forms the equatorial plane. And then you have an axial oxygen above the plane. And then you have another oxygen in the axial position below the plane to form a six coordinate complex. Although the history of bonding and the interpretation of reactions of coordination compounds really begins with Alfred Werner, coordination compounds were known much earlier and many coordination compounds have been used as pigments since antiquity. For example, there's Prussian blue. This is an iron complex with cyanide ligands. There's aurelian. This is a yellow complex of cobalt. And then there's the alizarian red dye. This is the calcium aluminum salt of 1,2-dihydroxy-9,10 anthroquinone. So these are those three uh, pigments that have been known for a, very, a long, for a very long time. And with the gradual development of analytical methods, the formulas of many of these compounds became known late in the 19th century, and the theories of structure and bonding became possible once we understood what the structures actually looked like. So let's look at some of the properties and electron configuration of transition metals. The properties of the transition metals are similar to each other and very different to the properties of the main group metals. They have high melting points, high densities, moderate to very hard, and very good electrical conductors. In general, the transition metals have two valence electrons. We are filling the d orbitals in the shell below the valence. Group 1b and some others have one valence electron due to promotion of electron into the d sublevel to fill it. And they form ions by losing the s electrons first and then the d electrons. The atomic radii of all the transition metals are very similar. There's a small increase in size down the column. So as we go from the first row to the third row, we have increase in atomic radii on the y-axis here. So there's only a small increase in size. But notice that there's very little difference between the second and the third row. And this is actually due to what's termed the lanthanoid contraction. Now the first ionization energy of the transition metals slowly increase across the series. So as we go across the periodic table, there's small increase as we go to the right in the first ionization energy. Now the third transition series are slightly higher than the first ionization energy. However, the, one of the things different about the transition metals is that the third row of the periodic table has first ionization energies that are slightly higher than the first and the second row. And this trend is opposite to the main group elements. The electronegativity of the transition metals slowly increase across the series, except for the last element in the series. So as you go to the right, you get a slowly increase in electronegativity, except for the last one. So this would be 
are zinc, mercury, and cadmium. And as you go down the column, the electronegativity, the electronegativity slightly increases. And this is opposite of the trend of the main group elements. Whereas in the main group elements, when we go down the periodic table, the electronegativity decreases. Whereas with the transition metals, you have a slight increase. When we were mentioning some of the properties of transition metals, we said that they're stable in multiple oxidation states. And this illustration here, this figure here, helps to illustrate that point. The red dots are the common and most important oxidation states of the transition metals. And the yellow ones are known oxidation states. So, for instance, manganese zero is known, but it's not as common as manganese plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus seven. One of the things that you should notice as we go across the periodic table the maximum oxidation state and the common oxidation state of these metals is the valence number. So scanning, this is in the third column as we go across the periodic table. Titanium is in the um, fourth column. So its highest oxidation is 4 plus. That's so removing all of the D and S orbitals. Vanadium goes to a plus 5. Chromium goes to a plus 6. Manganese maxes out with the highest known oxidation state of the transition metal, and this is a manganese plus 7 oxidation state. But once you cross manganese, the oxidation numbers, the max oxidation numbers, go back down. Now, you do not have to memorize this information. This is just more to illustrate to you the common oxidation states of the the metals and that they are stable in multiple oxidation states. So the transition metals often exhibit multiple oxidation states. The highest oxidation state is group number for groups three through seven. So scandium versus so scandium to manganese. So the highest oxidation state is the group number for groups three through seven which is scanning through manganese. For this slide, I just want to illustrate some common geometries for complex ions. Silver has a tendency to form linear complexes. So you have two ligands on either side of the metal, and you have 180 degrees between these ligands. And so this would be a coordination number of two, because there are two things bound to the metal center. Palladium and nickel and platinum and other metals with the D8, ox D8 number of electrons often form square planar complexes. So this palladium complex is four coordinate and all four of these ligands lie within the same plane. So that's square planar. Zinc is a, this zinc complex is a four coordinate complex. There are four amines attached to the zinc but this is a tetrahedral complex. So remember the bond angles here are 109.5, whereas in the square planar, the bond angles are 90 degrees from each other. And the last geometry that we'll look at is the octahedral. So these ligands would form the equatorial plane and these would be termed our axial ligands. So this is a six coordinate complex because there are six water molecules attached to that central iron atom.